I understand nobody wants to go to emergency department unnecessarily. However, if your body is having symptoms that are worrisome to you, then you may want to consider coming to emergency department so we can help you in diagnosing your problems. If you have chest pain, fever, short of breath, you worry about COVID, and you're worried whether you're sick enough to need to be admitted, then absolutely, we will try to help decide that with you. Let's say if you don't have COVID-like symptoms, yet you're having chest pressure, or you suddenly feel that you can't move your arm or your leg, then it's very important for us to help you in the emergency department to see if you have heart attack or stroke, which of course happens even at this time where we have COVID. Perhaps if you're in doubt, ask yourself this question. For the type of symptoms that I have, if it weren't for COVID, would I have gone to emergency department? If the answer is yes, you probably should be there so that we can help you. If, it's, if you're in doubt, call your family doctor or call 811 or 911 in your community. And we'll try to answer your questions and help you make the best choice for the type of symptoms that you're having. Wait times for specialist consults during COVID-19 are entirely dependent on the kind of specialist that you're waiting to see and the type of work environment that they are in. If they are involved with inpatient care of people who may be admitted with COVID-19, then it is possible that their outpatient clinics are being delayed. It also depends on where their clinic is. If their clinic is in a hospital setting, then many hospitals have stopped outpatient clinics for the time being. However, if their clinic is outside of the hospital setting, then they may be able to continue. However, they will not be able to do the visits in person. Those visits have now all been transferred to remote visits, either by phone or online. So therefore, the answer to your question is a difficult one and very much depends on the specialist as well as the location and the work environment. I think that actually is asking three questions, and I've written them down here. The first question is really, am I at increased risk to contract COVID-19? The second, am I at increased risk for severe disease? And the third is whether I'm at increased risk of severe outcomes. And I'll try to take you through those so that you feel more confident in the answer. I think the question about whether I'm at increased risk to contract COVID-19, you might need to understand a little bit about the immune system. And here's Immunology 101. There's essentially two main parts of the immune system. Firstly, the innate immune system. This is uh, to deal with non-specific threats to the body. So if you think about the skin, and here's a terrible diagram of a cut or a break in the skin, the skin is a natural barrier to stop germs and microbes entering the body. And so here, if you've got a cut, bacteria can get into the body and potentially cause an infection. Now, the second part of the immune system, the adaptive immune system, has various components. But if you think about white blood cells, they're often to deal with bacteria. So if you think about a pimple or an abscess uh, where an infection gets into the skin, the white blood cells gather around that invading microorganism and start attacking it to stop it spreading to the rest of the body. And the third part is the highly specific uh, part of the adaptive immune system. And this is the part where antibodies are made. Uh, this is how immunizations work. And these are the parts of the immune system that deal with viruses like COVID-19. And so the question is, you know, well, what parts of the immune system might be affected by diabetes or high blood sugars more importantly? And in many ways, we don't believe that the innate immune system is affected by diabetes, nor do we believe that the adaptive part to do with immunizations or antibodies is affected a great deal. The part that does get affected by high blood glucose levels is the function of white blood cells. And so that's why bacterial infections seem to be more common 
in people with poorly controlled or high blood sugar levels. So I hope that helps provide some background. It's often said that in autoimmune disease, people worry that their immune system, if they have type 1 diabetes, is somehow weak or impaired. I think that's not particularly helpful. You might actually argue that the problem with the immune system in type 1 diabetes is that it's misguided and that the body's affecting or attacking the pancreatic beta cells because it's mistaken them for a foreign invader. There are some uh, pieces of evidence that suggest that some viruses uh, are less likely to affect people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and we notice this when we look at blood donors and compare it with transplant recipients. It does seem that the rates of infections with common viruses like CMV seem to be different in people with type 1 diabetes. But at this point in time, there doesn't seem to be any link between type 1 diabetes and increased risk to uh, contract COVID-19. Now, the question about severe outcomes and severe infections is a really important one, which makes most of us worry. If you think about the spectrum of severity of any disease, uh, there's usually mild cases, moderate cases and severe cases. And I think what's particularly distressing about COVID-19 is it seems very difficult to predict how different people will be affected. We've heard stories about young people becoming very acutely and severely ill. And we've also heard of people having very mild cases and maybe not even knowing that they were infected. And the unpredictability makes us all feel quite vulnerable. There do, however, seem to be some factors that are associated with higher risk. So elderly people, people with heart disease, lung disease, and increasingly obesity is emerging as a factor that seems to predict people who are at higher risk for uh, more severe disease. And although diabetes was mentioned in many of the early comments, again, it seems to me that the association between diabetes and severe outcomes is much more to do with obesity type 2 diabetes and people who are already compromised because of other health concerns. And I wanted just to introduce the concept of vulnerability because I think it's fairly clear that somebody who's very elderly, who's frail, who's got a limited lung capacity, perhaps has had previous heart disease, it's not so surprising that somebody like that should be considered vulnerable and at risk for adverse outcomes. And here's the concept I've got here. Uh, as you can see, I've got doctor's writing and also doctor's artistic abilities. But if you think of this cliff uh, top here, and you can see the waves crashing below, and the wind coming from the side, these three building blocks, to my eyes, have different risks for falling into the ocean. So this small, low, smooth building block at the left-hand side, even if the wind blows very hard, I think it's unlikely that that's going to end up in the ocean. The tall block in the middle, it might well blow over and fall over, but I don't think it's going to end up in the ocean. The upside-down triangle gingerly balanced on the edge of the cliff, even if I sneeze, that might fall into the ocean. So I think we need to think about vulnerability. And again, at this point, young people with type 1 diabetes who are otherwise healthy, with good diabetes control, I think they are resilient. And I don't think they're vulnerable or at high risk to have severe outcomes uh, from COVID-19 infection. So I guess... That brings us to think, well, what are we going to do with this information? What can I actually do to protect myself? And really, as far as I can tell, these things are not specific to diabetes. The biggest thing that we can control is our risk to contract the infection. And that seems to be not so much related to diabetes control or blood sugar levels or anything like that. It's all about physical distancing. The second we can thing that people with diabetes can do is you can look after yourself, and that's in all domains of life, mental health, physical health, social health, and look after your diabetes, and that is really directed to avoiding health concerns later on. 
Certainly, if you can avoid needing to go to hospital, that would be very important at this time. The third thing, which I think is important that we remember at this stage, is the COVID-19 pandemic seems to be lingering on and on and on with perhaps a, a long time before we can anticipate some resolution. Don't delay getting help. If you notice changes in your vision, blurred vision, uh, difficulty reading things, you need to be seeing an eye specialist very promptly. Look after your feet. If you notice cuts in your feet or infections, go in and get them looked after too. The hospitals are here to look after people with all health concerns, not just COVID-19, and looking after people with diabetes is what I'm passionate about, and I would hate for anyone to delay getting treatment that they need uh, because of fears of COVID-19. So I hope that's been a little bit more engaging and entertaining than maybe the answers I've given in previous weeks. And I just wanted to say that this has been brought to you by your local friendly friend chronologist. The last week may have been challenging and you don't know what to eat anymore. Just remember that the way you were eating before the pandemic is still the way you should be eating now. So select whole grain products, fruit and vegetables, have protein at each meals and snack, limit your processed food, it's time to cook. And to achieve that, you need to plan ahead. Think about what you want to eat in the next week or two and put on your grocery list fresh but also frozen fruit and vegetables, some pulses, either dried or canned. You can have nuts, seeds, uh, dried fruits on your list. You can also add some canned uh, vegetables or canned fish. Those are all good ingredients if you need to postpone your next visit to the grocery store. I would also suggest that you have some carbohydrates in case you have an hypoglycemia, so make sure to have juice. Uh, maple syrup, honey, in addition to your glucose tablets at home. Uh, finally, I would just suggest that you follow your appetite and you enjoy your meal. The immune system of someone living with diabetes is dependent very much on the level of blood sugar control that that person has. If blood sugar levels are allowed to be higher, then the immune system is not as strong as someone whose blood sugar levels are closer to normal. And the decreased immunity is usually for things like bacterial infection and possibly for things like viral infection as well. However, in the case of COVID-19, from what we can tell, people living with diabetes are not at increased risk of getting COVID-19. However, if you get COVID-19, the severity of the disease may in fact be higher. Therefore, the most important thing that you can do is to control your blood sugars in terms of an element that you can control, and of course, to protect yourself as much as possible through all of the th measures that have been mentioned before, including proper hand washing, as well as not touching your face, and when going out in public, wearing some sort of face covering. We've received a question about whether or not it's necessary to use an alcohol swab to clean your insulin injection site before injecting. Apparently, in some parts of the country, it's becoming very difficult to find uh, insulin swabs in stores, and so people are wondering, is it okay to inject without cleaning? Actually, a number of years ago, a study was done to answer that question. They looked at the bacterial count on the skin before and after using a swab and showed that after the swab was used properly, the bacterial count was much lower. But does that mean there's really a benefit to swabbing, a benefit in terms of the health of the patient? So the researchers went on to study 1,700 injections in people with insulin with some swabbing and some not swabbing and showed no difference, no difference in local skin reactions and infections or infections where the bacteria would have gotten into the bloodstream. So while we obviously want to be as clean as possible when making an injection, it's not necessary to prepare the site with an alcohol swab if you aren't able to get a hold of them. <laughs> 